Well, good evening. This is Tuesday, October the 17th. This is Managerial Economics, ECP 3703. And examination number one closes this evening. I have not looked at the exams yet. I will be spending the next few days grading them. When I finish grading them, I will send you your grades on an Excel spreadsheet. I do not use the gradebook on Canvas. I don't trust it. So plan on seeing that spreadsheet in your email where I will list your grades by your Santa Fe ID number. I will also be spending the next four days grading both assignment one and I believe assignment two is due when? I don't know when it's due now, but I know it was originally due Sunday. Yeah, I think I extended it till Tuesday. I'm, I'm not sure. But I know there's a bunch of them already turned in, so I'll be working on that. What's on your mind? Anybody? Anything? It's getting nice. Oh, it's chilly. We have the white nationalist Rob Richard Spencer coming to speak at UF on Thursday. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I got an email about that. Yeah. I just saw a little thing in the news about him. I read the two letters from our President and U.S. President about yep. that. U.S. President has asked everybody who possibly will to not attend uh, okay. and avoid any chance of any confrontation or violence. Um, some friends of mine and I had planned to go downtown to supper Thursday night. We've canceled our plans because apparently there are a lot of folks who support Spencer coming into town from out of town. And I don't know how long they will stay here or how much trouble they may try to create. But we figured downtown was probably not the best place to be after dark. I think it was interesting and laudable that the president of the university, the mayor of Gainesville, the chair of the Alachua County Commission, and the president of Santa Fe College all came out together with a letter in the Gainesville Sun that basically condemned Richard Spencer and his bigotry and hatred and white nationalism. I thought that was commendable on their part and made it very clear those folks are not welcome anywhere in this area. They're kind of a reversal in the social progress of this country for the last 50 or 60 years at least. And why is he still coming? Because he likes the notoriety. Well, if the, if the president of the university doesn't want him to be here, then why is he? Because we have something called the First Amendment freedom of expression. But even though it's at the university, the president can't say, can't nope. tell him, can't. They tried to tell him in the beginning, earlier on, no, we don't want you here. And he said, you got to let me. And he, he is correct. And all four of the gentlemen I just described were all very upfront. We are allowing this because the man has the right to freedom of expression. And we are not going to impinge upon that freedom. However, he is imposing a cost on the university of over a half a million dollars for the security for this event. And he is not welcome here at all. Now, there may be a few people around who think he's great, but I think it'll be damn few. And the fewer that show up, the better. And the less coverage he gets in the local media, the better. He speaks hatred, bigotry, bias, not part of what this country was founded on. Anything else on your mind you want to talk about? Friend of mine, you just butt dial me again. <laughs> oh well. I guess it's safe to discuss it right now. Did you have any impressions of the exam? Was it 
Did you find it difficult or? I, I mean, it? a couple of the questions I kind of drew a blank on. I had a hard time remembering, but um, it took me a little bit, but then some of it came to me. Okay. Um, that's, that's very typical. But you have to think about it for a few minutes. But usually, and, and particularly in economics and essay questions, when you get one part of it, then you start remembering what it's associated with or it triggers a memory of something else. And it's kind of like getting a key to, to unlock the question. I don't, I mean, I'm, I think I did well. I hope I did well. But I did not think, I thought it was going to be a lot worse. And when I went, I was like, oh, okay. Well, then you did very well, or you didn't understand it. I don't know. And one or the other. Hopefully, it's, it's the first. <laughs> Hopefully, I did well. Because I was like, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It was everything that you had talked about I, and everything. Yeah, I thought it was very straightforward as far as what can you tell me about what we've been talking about or you've been reading about. But. And the math was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I thought those were very straightforward questions. They were, they were. I, I glanced at a couple of exams. And I saw a couple of people did the TVM calculations in a way I don't know what they were doing. But I haven't worked the key up yet. I don't know if they got the right answer. So we'll see. I, okay. couldn't, I couldn't get one of the math problems. I don't know why. And I thought I, I thought I knew what I was doing. But this, there's no way the answer was right. It didn't Which make one? sense. The, sec, the second one in, so number with six, I girls? guess. With the two girls. Yeah. Oh, one of them. I, could I not had to. I, I had think to do the it problem a couple was, of times. I had to do that one a couple of times. I got one and I was like, there's no way that that's I got it. That's what I said. So I read it the first one and I'm like, I, I got that right. I think I got it right. So I read it the second one and then it ended up a different number that looked correct. The so problem I, like, Hopefully I had right. was I did it with the 350 amount and that came out wrong. So I just did a rough calculation of it and it was like way less. Yeah, so I knew that I had to too. multiply the 350 by 12 to get an annual amount. Yeah, that's and what then, I should have done. I looked up after I left and I was like, that, oh, that was the problem I had yeah. with it. If you put down even partial, okay, well, I partially did. correct, you'll I get I put partial. the majority and I even wrote, like, I know this isn't right, but it's got to be close. <laughs> like, I'm doing something small but wrong, but I know that I'm on the right path. Oh, in one of the essays at the very last sentence, I said, this makes sense in my brain, hopefully it does. <laughs> Professor Strickland's brain, too. <laughs> I was like, I think this is the an answer that he wants. Hopefully it is. I think there were a couple of people that were making up the seven habits because they didn't know. Okay, one of them, I I'm going to go ahead. Mind. I'm going to go ahead and be honest. One of them I made up because I could not remember one of them. I remembered six, but one, I was like, doggone it, I cannot remember this. So I just made something up. I'm going to go ahead and apologize. I'm sorry. I couldn't remember the names of them at all, so I just wrote you a paragraph of what. That's cool. Because well, I, I could not, I could think of what I thought was the first one, but it's the second one and the last one was all I, and I had like just looked at it before I had <laughs> taken the test because I skimmed to see what the damage was going to be for this test. Like, yeah. what should I do first? I and I just thought could of those not, names. I could not I remember well, that. I, I, <laughs> we studied it when I was in high school. So again? We studied it when I was in high school, yeah. like that whole book. Yeah. So. That part, luckily, was already a little bit familiar. So Good. Just a breeze. But yeah. that, that we'll see how creative your suggested new habit was. <laughs> <laughs> how Be nice to book? people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that a big book? Is it? No. no. It doesn't seem like it it's, would be. It's, you could read it all in a day if you had to, but it's e it's it's e it's easy to read in three days, and it's much better to read once through and then a couple of pages every day, or at least every other day for the rest of your life. It just keeps reminding you of stuff that you need to pay attention to. Yeah. But you're going to grade them this week. I'm. I have got th all day Thursday, most of Friday, reserved to grade it. Saturday is my 11th wedding anniversary, so I don't know how much I'll be able to grade, but then I'm hoping Sunday I'll finish it off. Okay. Can, can I ask you a question then? Mm -hmm. You've been married more than once? Yes. I was married for 17 years, had two children, they are grown, and then I was single for 18 years. And now I've been married for 11. Is your wife's name Beth? Yes. Yes. How did you find that? It's on the disc profile at the beginning. It's yes, not her right. name, but it's not the last name. It's not name. the it's same, not the last same. name, Beth Roche. Did you guys meet doing that? <laughs> How much time you got? <laughs> In 1978, Beth and her husband, Bob, were my next door neighbors. And that was two years before I came to Santa Fe. 
I was in graduate school. They remained my neighbors until 1986 when they moved back to Chicago where they were both from. And I never expected to see him again, but I got a Christmas card from Beth every Christmas. My wife and I separated in 1986 also, and never heard from him. And then somewhere in the 90s, they came through Florida, and we had opened our taxidermy business, and they stopped and said hi there. Didn't see him again until about 2004, 2000, no, probably 2002. She had sent me the Christmas card thing, you know, I'd send one back about three months late. And then she sent me a note and said, I've got a new job. Instead of doing clinical work, I'm going to be an, a teacher, teaching how to use our machines. I got some questions about teaching, machine I was teaching. And we talked a bit about that, didn't think anything about it. And then in 2005, I got an email from her and she said, I'm coming through Florida on a to go to a conference. By now, she was divorced and living out in Arizona. She said, I'm coming to a conference for my national association in Orlando, no, in Fort Lauderdale. And I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna come in a few days early, come up to Gainesville, see some friends. If you're around, I'd like to say hi. Sure. So she came up to Gainesville, saw some friends, stopped by my place, we went out to supper. We stayed up till five o'clock in the morning just talking. A phenomenal experience. Did the same thing the next day. She spent all day seeing her friends. We went out to supper, talked all night. She got in the car and drove away. And I thought, what a fascinating, wonderful person. Wish I could see more of her. But she'd said, uh, when I leave here, I'm going back to Fort Lauderdale, where I'm going to go to my conference, and there's this guy I've been seeing, so I'm going to see him down there. I thought, that's cool. But as she left, I thought, that's not cool. <laughs> Didn't like that. So I called my daughter, who lives in Fort Lauderdale, who knew Beth when my daughter was in Girl Scouts, selling Girl Scout cookies. I said, listen here, I need you to do me something. She said, what's that? I said, Beth is going to give a seminar at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning in this hotel. I want you there at 7.30 in the morning with a dozen red roses. I want you to surprise her with it. Okay? Okay, Dad. And she showed up. And of course, Beth was stunned and, and by the roses, but also by Dee Dee showing up because she hadn't seen her since she was a little kid. And I'm thinking to myself, let me see you explain those red roses to this guy you're going to be seeing. So that worked pretty well because, oh, a few weeks later, I flew out to Tucson, Arizona, where she lived. And we started dating, courting, whatever you want to call it. So that was in November of 05. We got married in October of 06. <laughs> it was neat. Really, really nice. And by, by that time, I was 57 years old. She was 51. And to be that far along in life and then discover somebody was kind of better than the first time. So life has been good. Very, very good. She's a sweetheart. But she kept her married name, Roche, because she had established a professional reputation and didn't want to be confusing people. So, okay, whatever. I don't, we'll check into a hotel once in a while and she'll use her card and then they'll call me Mr. Roche. And I'm thinking, no, no, that's that other guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. So, anything else you want to know about me? <laughs> I had a different impression. I was just thinking, like, your wife now was the wife you've always had. She was, like, the mom of your kids. Like, I had never picked up anything that said you were single for 18 years or had been divorced or anything like that. Only now, when you said 11 years, did it occur to Very good with the math. I'm impressed. <laughs> now I just did time value calculations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, are you gonna have you graded or looked at the videos yet? No, I have not. Yeah. That's, I've been saving those. Of this whole thing starts tomorrow, Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Will you tell us our grades on those too? Oh yes. Oh yes. Okay. Um, what happens with those? All the assignments. And I'm trying. No, not the not the test, but all the assignments. I load those into something on Canvas for us as instructors called Speed Grader. 
and I go down and I can assign points and then I can make comments and that's how you'll see it coming back to you. I'm not exactly sure what it looks like but it'll come back to you as the results of this assignment and that'll have you great. I think it shows under recent feedback. Mm -hmm. Especially, I think it shows like under recent this thing, feedback. under recent feedback. Okay. It's like a little tab that runs on the side that shows you upcoming assignments and okay. stuff. And it comes down there, just saying. Cool. And I will, uh, I will make comments on the videos and on the value statements. And anybody that wants to, and I'm saying this to everybody who hopefully watches this on video, anytime you want to sit down and talk about that stuff, I would be delighted. And assignment 34, do you Yeah, I think so. Okay, I have a question about that because okay. four is, uh, what What are we supposed to be doing about that? Are we... What is four? It's the one where it's a mock meeting and you have to oh. do the salaries and... Yeah, you've got a meeting with about, I don't know, seven or eight people coming to it and you know the salaries of each person. Okay, so far. So if a person makes $38,000 a year, we usually figure that the year is 50 weeks at 40 hours a week, or 2,000 hours. So 2,000 hours equals one year. So if you're making $38,000 for 2,000 hours, you're being paid at the rate of $19 an hour. So if you do that for each person attending that meeting, and add up how much each one of them is costing you for that one or two hour meeting, you get an idea of what that meeting cost financially. And what I'm trying to do is, is paint you a picture with that exercise. What is the financial cost of holding meetings? But then also, what is the social capital cost? We have a couple of departments here at the college who hold departmental meetings on Fridays at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, you may not be aware of it because you're not out here on, on, during the days or particularly on Fridays, but on Fridays on this campus, it is like a tomb. It is deserted. We have over the years structured almost all, not quite, but many, many, most of our classes classes to meet either Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday. And of course, for the department chair and the administrators, Friday is the only day they know they can get all the faculty to show up because so few people are teaching. But what happens when you give people which is, uh, what is effectively a four-day week? They come to expect it. And they make other plans for Fridays. Now I tell you, I, co I come out here Fridays, I see other people out here Fridays, we're working on our own, we're working in our offices, we're doing stuff, but not every Friday. And so when you throw in and say, hey, we're going to have a departmental meeting every other Friday at 2 o'clock, what do you suppose people, how do you suppose people react to that? The majority of them are very upset, very angry, very resentful. And that's that social capital cost. What happens when you impact the morale, the attitude, the social capital, the trust, the giving, taking, working together between your employees? They start grousing and complaining, and they feed each other in their anger. And the distance between them and their department chair grows, and so that principle of exchange and the trust involved is diminished. And so if you're having a meeting every other Friday at 2 o'clock, you can tell me how much it's costing in money terms, but can you give me some, not quantitative, but qualitative description of what else that meeting is costing you in terms of your, your morale of your people and their, excited, their level of excitement to go to work, etc. And of course, what is the theme behind this assignment? What's the moral of the story? Cost-benefit analysis? It, it is an example of that. But what, 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 what do you suppose is my feeling or my, my you know, teaching point that I want to get across to you about meetings? Well, 
make them where they you don't diminish social capital and they want to participate and do it? Make Good. You're right. Say again. Make them count. Make them count if you absolutely have to have them. Think about this. Traditional businesses through time have been somewhat pyramid shaped. Top management, very few people. Middle management, middle managers, okay? And the people who actually did the work, right? What happened with the advent of computers in the 1980s? Well, we discovered that what middle managers generally did the most of was they relayed information up and down. Here's our quota. How's your sales going? We need to ramp up more production on this. We need raw, more raw, raw materials on that. Here's how we're doing. Here's how our quota is. Here's what our sales are doing. And so they were information transmittals, okay, a conduit. What do you suppose computers did to that? Disrupted it. Computers said that where you used to have 200 people, you could do it with about 17. And middle management got wiped out. That's what happened in the 1980s. That was the technological impact on middle management of computers and improved communication. Given that, we have this technology that allows this communication. My question to you, if you are up here, is do you really need to see these people physically in front of you in order to communicate to them? And I suggest to you that 98% of the time, the answer is a resounding no. And you should reconsider, if you're having regular meetings, whether they are absolutely essential, and if you cannot reduce the number and make them more worthwhile, or even more fun. In the business programs department here at Santa Fe College, with every director of that program I've seen now for 38 years, that's six different directors, None of them had a faculty meeting except at the beginning of the term. That's all we needed because then they could, they could still communicate with us along the way. So the point of exercise number four is for you to appreciate the various costs of holding meetings and understand that that is something to be avoided, if at all possible. Now, there are some advantages to meetings. Don't, don't misunderstand me. What would be the advantages to having face-to-face -face meetings? Make sure you get your point across. So everyone Good. can understand how serious you're being. Clarity of communication. Okay, so there's no ambiguity, no confusion, and people have plenty of time both to ask questions and sometimes to challenge you and make you go, oh, gee, I need to reevaluate that. So that is very helpful. Not that a lot of it can't occur by technology. What's another advantage to, a me to holding meetings, regular meetings? Discuss department-wide problems. Good. To discuss and sometimes discover that several of you are having the same problem, but you hadn't talked to one another. And when the two of you raised it and started chatting, six more people chimed in and said, me too. So there's some synergistic advantages to occasionally being together. That's good. Any other advantages to having a face-to-face -face meeting on a regular basis? I have one every month on my whole job. That's fine. Good. The other advantage is social capital. A, man, a meeting can either deplete social capital or it can increase it in the sense that we get together, we enjoy the camaraderie and the exchange of ideas and information and experiences and the laughter, and we feel like, yeah, we're, we're more united, we're more, more comfortable with one another, we are more open with one another. So a well-conducted meeting can be beneficial. It's just when you overdo it, you tend to just destroy the souls of the people who are forced to attend, okay? In my economics uh, department, where I am the lead faculty, we meet for lunch, maybe once a term. We all go down to the Northwest Grill for, for lunch on a Friday, and we announce it in advance, and usually almost everybody shows up, and we sit around and talk about all the common problems we share, like students that don't come to class, or students that don't study, or textbooks that we think are terrible, or publishers we don't like. 
and we have a great time. It's a kind of a cathartic releasing all of our anger and frustration, and then we go back to work. But it makes it easy for us to, to what's the word I want? Commune with one another and share our experiences. So that's the purpose of you know, uh, assignment number four, and given what we said, it should be fairly straightforward and quick to accomplish. Okay, anything else, anybody? We're gonna to start tonight on another mathematical application, not supply and demand yet. The supply and demand stuff, the basic economic stuff, S and D, supply and demand, is available in videos found on the course schedule. And I would ask that you review those and know the basics of how you shift the supply curves and the demand curves to see what happens to equilibrium. You saw it all in micro. It should be a review. And we'll, we may do a couple of those just by illustration uh, towards the end of the night, but I'm not trying to drag you through microeconomics in great depth all over again. Just want to make sure you go over the basics here. We'll add with that some of the calculations we're getting ready to do and uh, see where that takes us. All right, so make sure you've looked at these videos, et cetera. Um, I may post some more information or a set of study questions. Watch for the announcements on that. What I would like you to do tonight is join with me in uh, a sort of a calculation we loosely address under the topic of break-even analysis. What does it mean to break even? It's the point where you, I think of it financially, where you, um, it's the point where you cover your costs and you can start generating profit. Perfect. It's that point where you finally cover your costs, but you're not yet making a profit. Okay? It's that point where your total revenue of your business exactly equals your total expenses. The concept, I think, should be fairly straightforward. But I want to look at a couple of ways we use this approach or this concept. Problem number one, you're going to make a product. Product A, maybe it's a game or something, a board game, I don't know. And when you make this product, it has a cost every time you produce it of $18 per unit. That's your cost of manufacturing it to include your overhead. What does overhead mean? Your fixed cost. Your fixed cost, your utility bill, your rent bill, the stuff that you got to pay no matter how many of these you make or don't make. It's still the same fixed cost. So this then is, in economic terms, your variable cost. Okay? That it's going to cost you $18 a unit. Let's say that your fixed costs... are $2,000 a month. So at the most basic level, riddle for me this, if I can sell these things at a price of $40 each, how many of them do I have to sell? to break even. How many do I have to sell to break even? 91? I don't know, you're way ahead of me. <laughs> Which isn't hard to do. How many? 91. 90, I thought you said 71. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, 91 units. Anybody else get that?
what's going on here? Think of it this way. Every time you sell a unit, what happens? You get 40 bucks, but it cost you 18. So how much did you make on that unit? $22. $22, you see that? We're gonna ignore the fixed costs for a minute. We know that every time I sell one, I get a price of 40 minus a cost of 28, uh, 18. So I make $22 per unit. Is that profit? Not until you uh, hit, make this, hit a certain amount to cover your fixed. Bingo, you got it. <laughs> Not until you have paid your fixed costs. So here's my terminology. We're going to have the price minus the variable cost of producing this product, the $18. That equals the contribution margin. In this case, 40 minus 18 equals 22 dollars and so I want you to get comfortable with the idea of contribution margin if you've taken accounting you might have loosely called this gross margin but I think it's much more useful to think of it this twenty two dollars can now be contributed towards paying the fixed costs so my break-even calculation is fixed costs divided by contribution margin. In this case, I got $2,000 a month in fixed costs. I got a $22 contribution margin. It comes up 90.91 units or something like that. We can't sell a partial unit, so I got to sell one more full unit. 91 units for break even. Well, at 91 units, how much is my revenue? My revenue is 91 units times $40 each. You okay with that? $364. No, $3,640, $3, thank you. Okay. How much is my costs? How much are my costs? $1,638. You took $18 a unit times 91 units, and you got how much? $1,638. $1,638. Is that all of my costs? No, plus two thousand for the Good. fixed costs. That's my sixteen thirty-eight variable costs. Plus, I got two thousand dollars in fixed costs, so my costs are going to be yeah, thirty-six thirty-eight. That's probably out of sight. Oh, just made it thirty-six thirty-eight. There's a little bit of a rounding difference between that and thirty-six forty, but they are essentially the same number. And that's how I prove my break-even. Any questions? Anybody? Not too advanced. If you can see what the contribution margin means, I think that's the quickest way to understand this in a hurry. I'm going to make 22 bucks a piece on these suckers. How many I got to make to pay my fixed costs? Okay, so far? Once we've done that, then we start playing something called, uh, sometimes called sensitivity analysis. Which might also be called, what if? So right now I know I need to sell 91 units. What if I changed my price and made my price be $50? Well, 
What would happen to my break even? It'll let be lower. It'll be lower. What will happen to my contribution margin? My contribution margin is my price minus variable costs. So that would be, I'm sorry, 50 minus 18. My contribution margin goes up to $32. Instead of making $22 every time I sell one, I make $32. So my break even is my fixed cost over my contribution margin, which is 2,000, now divided by 32 units whatever that is. Falls down to 62.5, which we must round up, 63 units to break even instead of 91 units. How are we doing so far? Which price would you suggest? The higher price, right? It's a tricky question. Huh? The one the consumers will pay. It depends on the market. At that point, you stop and say, damn, I would love to sell it for 50 bucks, but what's my competition? How many other products out there are similar to mine and competing with me, and what is their price? Is this the sort of product that people get really loyal to, or that, you know, if I give them a little bit better price, they'll switch in a minute? Okay, And so what we're looking at is, is almost out of traditional economic analysis. We're saying that at a price of $40, I need to sell 91 units. At a price of $50, I need to sell 63 units. So when we look at these two points, they are somewhat like the two points on a demand curve. And so when we look at that, we ask, which one is the better price? And what I want you to be able to do is ask the questions you should be asking yourself if you're making that choice, $50 or $40. Okay, variable costs for 91 units, variable costs for 63 units. Let's calculate what that is. It's 18 times 91, or it's 18 times 63. It's either $1,638 or some number I can't do in my head. Looks like $1,134. What is that telling me? As you're trying to decide what price to charge. You're looking at $91 or 60, I'm sorry, 91 units or 63 units, you're looking at a price of either $40 or a price of $50. What's the nice thing about a price of $50? You make your break even point quicker. I make my break even point quicker, and I have to invest less money into the business to produce my break even output. I have to tie up less of my money this way than I do that way. The higher price has plenty of attractions. Okay. But not if you can't sell it. Yet. Bingo. I mean, it's going to be great if I can sell it for 50 bucks because I don't have to work as hard. But how much harder is it going to be to sell it $50 as opposed to $40? So you may not actually make your break even quicker because you're not selling the volume you need to get there fast enough. If it's hard to sell them at $50, but I know I can sell them at $40, this gets 
And this could get to be quite a chore. But if I decide, to, for example, first of all, I've got, I've got to do a fairly good bit of research in the market, right? What have I got to know about the market? I got to know about my competitors. Who sells a similar product? How many are there? How many competitors? Where are they located? What message or brand do they deliver to the customers that make people want to buy their product? So I would want to look at their advertising. What kind of advertising? Where do they advertise? What particular unique advantages do they seem to have, if any? All of this falls under the broad topic of competitive, again, analysis. And sometimes we see the word used in here, benchmarking. What is the most successful competitor doing? And can we match or beat that? And in order to do that, we've either got to offer more or cost less. And you get a lot of different things to think about when you talk about selling a high price versus selling a low price. In terms of pricing strategy, to look at the extremes, you can either skim or you can penetrate. Price skimming is you're just going to find the few folks out there that are willing to pl spend plenty of money, and you're going to sell to them. You're going to sell BMWs, not Fords. Does that make sense? If you're selling BMWs instead of Fords, what are you trying to sell? What does that person want to buy? We're back to the principle of exchange. Luxury, Luxury comfort, style, status, okay? If you're going to sell that person comfort, luxury, style, status, your advertisement, for example, is going to look a whole lot different then if you're trying to sell him the cheapest truck he can possibly buy. Well, that's your marketing demographic. You bet. What we've got to do is, is, we, is we look at, by the way, penetration pricing means you sell at the lowest possible price to get as many customers as you can. What's the problem with a penetration pricing strategy? You may not really get the best customers or... Bingo. That's one of the most important that most of the times folks don't think about. We found this out, for example, in the taxidermy business. If we tried to advertise our taxidermy at the lowest price around, we'd get plenty of customers. What kind of customers? The ones whose checks bounce. Yeah. The ones who never come back and pick it up when it's done and you've got to store it and sometimes that gets to be expensive. Okay. The ones who complain the most are typically your nickel dimers. At the same time, however, if you can deal with that, set in place different policies, you know, we're going to have your deer head ready in 90 days, and if you don't pick it up uh, at the end of the 100th day, we're going to charge you storage on your deer head of $3 a day. 
That got rid of a lot of problems. People started picking stuff up on time pretty damn quick. That's $100 a month if you don't come pick it up, okay? If your check bounces, okay, we're coming after you. We got an attorney, and we're going to impose a fee on you of $150 service charge for the collection of this debt plus the amount of the check, okay? So don't bounce a check on us. And we'll make sure, because we know the people down at the local paper, that if we take you to court, that's reported in the paper. So people know that if you come to this business, you don't bounce a check, because they're going to come after your butt. Okay, maybe shame you on the wall of shame. Yeah, if we can find a way to shame you without committing libel or slander, we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, so if you decide that you can manage this lower price crowd, there's a hell of a lot of them out there. And low price will bring in a lot more business. Just ask Walmart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have a question before we continue. What yeah. do you call that when you target the lower type of people and it somehow trickles into the type of employees you seem to hire to handle it? Because I hate Walmart. I mean, I shop there, don't get me wrong, but I dread it. It becomes a sort of a self-reinforcing circle. You get lousy customers who create lots of problems and make life miserable for your employees, who in turn resent the customers and treat them poorly, who makes them, which makes them even worse customers. I thought there was like an economic thing for like when you got so big that you like lost touch with... I thought I, somewhere I felt like I had read something about that, but... I, I could the, be, the phenomenon is clearly out there, but sure. I'm not sure what it is. Okay. We see businesses that start small and they know their, their clientele and many and of them know personally and that makes them popular. Right. But then they grow and it's a, it's a whole different world of running, running your own business with maybe 100, 150 customers that you serve regular to having a different, bigger business with 10,000 customers that you don't know any of them. I thought it was just economies of scale, but when I've read about that recently, it, it's something different so there are there are inefficiencies to scale or diseconomies to scale that when you get so big your costs get out of control and and it, they don't talk about this in the economics books but they do in the marketing books when you get that big your relationship to your customers begins to diminish so maybe i distance. am kind of thinking of you're thinking exactly the right concept i don't know of a term for it okay off the top of my head i don't know why i was yeah okay yeah. moving on i'm sorry well just think about this for wherever you wind up working. If it's a, if it's a business and, and the economy, by the way, looks like it's getting better, and the business says, you know, we're doing $250,000 a year sales, we think next year if we build another shop down in Ocala, we can grow to five hundred, maybe $600,000 in sales. Well, I want you prepared to look at that and say, oh, what's going to be the issues when we start getting bigger? Okay. When the distance between us and our customer gets greater, when the number of steps between top management and actual workers gets bigger, well, you got communication problems and those evolve into morale problems, et cetera, et cetera. Your social capital issues get big. So I wanted to touch on that somewhere in this course. Um, what, we, what we're thinking about is what's my better strategy, but you brought up a good term, what I've got to do is I've got to identify who is my target market or markets. This is kind of using some market segmentation. How many BMWs are you going to sell to people over 65 years old? Damn few. They're past sports cars. Most of them. Most of them. Well, because almost all of the nice, like, and I know this isn't a BMW or whatever, but like the really nice, classic, really well done cars, I only see those driven by older people. Well, I don't see like. Give me the name of the car. Oh, okay. Give me an example. Because it varies with brand. Who, who drives it? the Cadillacs? Old people. Old people. Lincoln. Lincoln's, Lewis. yes. BMWs 
have a different position in the market. You're right about that. Yeah. They, and look at the people in their advertisements. That's all well, you got to do. And classic cars would be kind of its own thing, too, because oh, yeah. that's like a, you know... What, you know, if you were going to open up a shop in Gainesville and you were going to retail out, sell, refurbished, upgraded classic cars, a 1967 Mustang, the 1966 Corvette, who's going to be your market? And I don't know. That's a tough question. Collectors? Of some huh? Collectors of like middle Definitely age. collectors if you can figure out who they are. But do, do collectors or people who appreciate those cars, do they have some common denominators? Um, I'll tell you one they got. Expend extra income? They got money. Disposable income? Because you can't drive a nice old upgraded 66 vet for less than, I don't know, twenty, forty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. So, Sadly. Okay. But what do you look for? You look for the common denominators in your target market. What do they have in common? If, and the common, you know, the most common things we look at are age, gender, geographic location, those are called demographics. Demographics. These are things we can, we can tell pretty quickly about you, statistically or by looking at you. We can judge what age group you are, you're in, what kind of profession you're in, where you live, how much money you make, what color your skin is, okay? But demographics are not always enough. Sometimes the people that buy a product are spread across all kinds of age groups, all races, all religions. And so then we start looking at maybe psychographics. What, are, what is going on in their mind? What are they looking for? What's important to them? Democrats, mostly young or mostly old? I don't think you can cut them by age, no more than you can Republicans. I think Republicans are primarily older white male and their spouses. But there's a lot of them that aren't. I think Democrats are primarily younger, uh, diverse across race, religion. But it's hard, hard to be sure about that. But I tell you one thing about, Demo about Democrats versus Republicans, right? Among the Democrats, there are more people who are not affiliated with a religion, who call themselves agnostic or atheist or, you know, spiritual. What else? Democrats and Republicans. Across any age group you look at, mostly Democrats will say, we think the government does good things. Not always, but, but government does, does a lot of good things. Republicans will tell you government is the source of most of the problems in this country. And see, that has nothing to do with their demographics. It has to do with the way they're thinking. So psychographics includes the way they think, and it also includes, we might consider this, values, attitudes, and lifestyles. Sometimes we need to segment our market or identify our target market based on their values. If you were going to sell, assuming it was legal, if you were going to sell silencers for pistols, what kind of a value system would a person have who would want to buy a silencer for a pistol? Pro-gun. Pro-gun. Cuts across all age groups, cuts across demographics. Okay? So as you look at your product, this is kind of where I, I wanted to finish anyway, but as you look at your product and remembering all this stuff in the background, the first thing you want to know with your product is what need or needs does it serve? If you never, never learned anything else about marketing, learn this first starting point. If I put you in charge of or on a committee for the marketing of Santa Fe College, I want to make you responsible for growing our enrollment by 15% every year for the next five years. Okay? That's a marketing job. 
The first question you've got to ask is what does Santa Fe do? What need does it serve for different constituents, different target markets? What role does Plant Santa Fe play? You want to take a stab at that? Educating to get people into the workforce. I like that workforce. You're getting close to where I'm thinking about certificate programs, certificate programs, etc. Alternative a education step step. For UF. Very Community close. Community education. A step for UF. To me, Santa Fe is your easiest to get into, lowest cost route after high school. Okay, I'm not sure where you want to go, and I'm not sure where it may eventually lead to lead you. But I'm telling you that you came to Santa Fe. And those are two of the biggest reasons students come here. It's cheaper and it's easy to get into. Not necessarily easy to get out of, but it's easier to get into. And if you are going to the University of Florida, A, it's damn difficult to get in there as a freshman anyway. But this college transfers more freshmen into the University of Florida than any other college in, in the country. So this might be the right route to do that. So that's one of the needs Santa Fe satisfies. It satisfies another need, and you right here in this classroom are the example of it. It satisfies the need of people out in the real world leading real lives who cannot go back and be a full-time student, but could definitely use a bachelor's degree to progress their careers. And so we created the BAS programs here with exactly that in mind that we would offer a route to a bachelor's degree in selected fields for people who could not quit their life and go down and be a full-time student in Florida because that was the only way to go to school there. And I've been working on this since I started here 38 years ago. We had AA students who would finish here and they were damn fine students, but they had wives, they had families, jobs, children, parents to take care of. They couldn't just quit everything and go down and be a full-time Florida student. And I bitched and griped and complained about that for 20 years before anybody even listened to me. I went to Florida, to the College of Business, and I said, why don't you guys offer more day and nighttime programs and serve the community? And the answer was, we don't need to. We got all the students we want. And so St. Leo started coming in and they helped, except they're expensive. And Nova Southeastern University out of Fort Lauderdale, they started up programs around here where you'd put about 25 people together and they would do their junior and senior year by coming to class one night a week and every third weekend. And I taught for 10 years in that program because we were taking people who really had great potential but couldn't go back and be a full-time student. Two of the vice presidents at Santa Fe were students of mine 25 years ago in that program. So you've got to ask, what does Santa Fe do? What needs does it serve? Okay. This is the first step and the most important step of marketing, is understanding what your people, your customers are buying. So this is the first step of a marketing plan. And this is going to apply if you're working for somebody who, like I said, wants to expand their business or wants to pick up a new product. Suppose you work for the guy out in Alachua who builds uh, uh, boats. He's a boating manufacturer. He builds fishing boats and ski boats and, you know, pleasure boats. They run up from about 16 up to about 23, 24 feet, okay? And suppose you got a job out there working with him, and he said, listen, I'm thinking about starting to make uh, jet skis. What do you think? What would you be thinking? Jet skis. We have the technology to make them. We know how to build stuff out of fiberglass, put motors in it, and make it run like a scalded dog. What would you be thinking? The first thing you better think is, what does a jet ski do for people and what does that have in common with boats? And there looks to be a lot of similarities. And in fact, you may can do some cross-selling. You've got a boat, boats are a lot of fun. You know what else would be fun to have with you? A couple of these jet skis. Maybe you sell it to the same people. But you've got to start out with what needs does your product or service serve? If I'm selling you clothing, you come into my store and I've got nice suits shirts, ties. What am I selling you? What need, what, truly, what am I selling you? I'm not selling you suits. I'm not selling you shirts. I'm not selling you ties. What am 
I selling you? Your personal money. I'm selling you your image of you and what you want other people to see. And if I can persuade you that that is what's going on, you will now consider me your friend and ally. If I can educate you about the impact of blue shirts versus white shirts, of black jackets versus brown jackets, of red ties versus pink ties, and you come to rely on me to help you make those choices, to present that image you want to present, to either feel the way you want to feel or go where you want to go, then I've got a connection. But if you come in and I just say, what you looking for? I'm killing myself. I should be engaging you, asking you, what do you do for a living? You know, where do you figure to wear these clothes? You know, how big is your wardrobe right now? Do you like the job you're in? Are you looking to get promoted? I'm not going to ask you right off the bat, but I'm going to ask you along the way in some general, kind, caring, inquisitive conversation. All of this, starting with this step, also applies to me and you, because we got to sell ourselves. This is back to a job interview. We're back to the first six weeks on a job. What need do you serve? When I interviewed for this job at Santa Fe, I was told off, I was an adjunct. I'd been an adjunct for one term, and they said, hey, we're going to hire a full-time teacher for business programs. Why don't you apply for it? I said, hey, great, I, I love that. I really like this job. They said, well, we've already figured out who we're going to hire, but we want you to apply for it. It would look good. I'm thinking, okay, I'll tell you what. Make me the last person you interview. Oh, sure, we can do that. Good. They had 25 people apply for the job. They interviewed about eight of them every day. For the first two days, I sat out here and watched them go in, watched them interview, and watched them come out, men and women. Guess what they wore? Nice clothes. What kind of clothes? Suits. Suits. Darks, blue suits, black suits, white shirts, ties, men and women, scarves, heels, closed-toed pump shoes, you know. How do I look at it look like robots out of IBM? And I thought, what are they looking for here? What are they trying to hire? They want somebody who knows business, who has some expertise. But well, what do they really need here? Someone that's relatable to the students. Someone who can con yeah, connect with the students. So I watched that for two days, and the third day before I came out here, I put on a pair of khakis, a short sleeve white shirt, and a tie. And highly shined shoes, and I came out here with all my materials, and I went to my job interview. And all of my materials were brochures and my credentials from college, you know, but brochures on seminars I had taught around the country to land surveyors, architects, and engineers, wearing a coat and tie, looking like the authority, whole list of different topics we taught. There's no doubt Strickland knew the business. But then I sat down with him and I, you know, I said, what you people really need out here is not just an expert in business, but somebody who can take your students and motivate them and help them get to where they want to go in life. That's what you really need out here in my opinion. And I can do that. I can show you my evaluations. And at the end of the interview, you know, they were kind of, I had got them doing the bobblehead, the nod, you know, you like that. At the end of the interview, I said, they said, or, we're all done. Do you have any questions? I said, I, I feel great about this. I've only got one question. Is there anything that you've seen in my credentials or anything that I've said today that would make you believe I can't do this job as well or better than anybody you've talked to? What kind of question is that? Have you had it's Mr. Fitzgerald's job. class? Have you had salesmanship yet? Oh, y'all are HSA. I'm sorry. You don't have to take that. That's a closed question. It's when you're trying to get somebody to say, yes, I'll buy it. And they looked at me, and all three of them on the, on the interview committee said, uh, no, no, I don't think so. That's when I knew I had a shot at the job. And I got the job. Because you have to, sometimes you have to tell them what they're buying, what they're looking for. But that's the most important thing in the world, to sell yourself or to sell any anything else. There are six other steps in here we'll kind of get through as we go along in building a marketing plan. I want you to understand that. But it's common sense approach to whatever it is you're selling. There are some commonalities and ways of thinking that will make you more successful than others, that will keep you from floundering around wondering, what do I do next? OK?
I get in here in the evenings, and I personally, I really enjoy talking about these sort of things. Y'all sit there so silent. I feel like sometimes I'm just boring you silly. And that's too bad. Because it's my class, and you got to listen to it. We'll go back and do some marketing. We'll, we'll do a little bit more of uh, break-even type stuff. Here's one of the things I've got in plans for you. You walk into a building, it's a store in a shopping center, and you figure the store is 60 feet, no, I'm sorry, it's yeah, 60 feet this way and it's 40 feet this way, and it rents for $28 a foot, and you are going to estimate all the fixed costs, all the variable costs, and you're going to calculate, therefore, could I make a go of a business in this store? I want you to learn how to think in terms of how much money is this business got to be bringing in? How much money is it generating? How much is it costing? I wonder how much profit they're making. I went over to Jersey Mike's Subs the other day. Ever been there? Walked into Jersey Mike's Subs and I, I just sat there waiting on my sandwich and started estimating how big is this place? How many people work here? wonder what it costs them to operate. And then I started looking at counting the people who came out in the space of 15 minutes. And in 15 minutes, 14 people came in and out. If 14 people come in every 15 minutes, how many people is that in an hour? Almost 40, uh, 60. Yeah. It's 28 times two. If you can get 56 people an hour, how much does the average person spend on a sub and a drink? The answer I thought was about eleven dollars. <coughs> okay, that tells me that they should be making fifty-six and fifty-six. That would be six hundred and sixteen dollars an hour. And if they're open for nine hours a day, what's that? Fifty-four, fourteen, fifty-five. They should be making somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty-five hundred dollars a day if they keep that volume all day long. Well, they won't. So I'll cut that by sixty percent. I've already now got an estimate on what kind of cash flow is coming into that business. And I can count the number of squares. How big are these tiles? Two, two, two by two. They're 24 inches each way, I think. I can count the number of tiles and tell you how big this room is. Pretty damn accurate. And if I know what rental rates are like wherever I'm at, which I can learn pretty quick, I can tell you how much it's costing them at Jersey Mike's to rent that store space. And I can look and see that they got four employees in there all the time, and I figure, what do you make when you're working in a, in a sub shop? Eight, nine dollars an hour. Counting the payroll taxes and everything, those, those employees are costing them eleven dollars an hour. So I can tell you how much your payroll costs are. And at the end of all this, I can sit back and look and say, is this a viable business or not? I love to do that when I go into a restaurant. I sit down, I measure the size of the place, and then I take a look at the menu and see what the average prices are like. And then I count the number of chairs, seating places in the restaurant. And I figure out what their volume could be. And I, then I watch and see how busy they are. And I go plug all that back in. And I sometimes I look up and I think, this place will be gone in six months. Other times I'll walk in and I think, these people are a genius. This is phenomenal. I would like you to be able to think in those terms as part of just a, you know, an approach to life. Okay? So we'll play a little bit more with that kind of stuff. We will take a look next time at doing the supply and demand graphs, shifting the demand curve. Remember this, if you will. There are five things that shift the demand curve, and there are five things that shift the supply curve. You should know those ten things. They're right there in those first videos. In fact, I think there are four PowerPoints that demonstrate that. I will check uh, Canvas again tomorrow and make sure they're available to you, but I'm pretty sure there are. There are some very simple supply and demand quizzes for you to practice with. You can anticipate that on the next exam, if there are eight questions, one or two of them will be with supply and demand. Two or three of them will be with marketing and that kind of thing. One or two of them will be with break-even calculations. That's kind of where we're going for the next exam. Okay. So still uh, made up of long response? Questions? Um, not so much. Okay. Not so much. I may borrow from the uh, the uh, assignments I made you, like the meeting, the meeting planning, and I might give you a question out of that. 
strictly <clears throat> based on what we said today. <clears throat> what would you do if you walked into a job where your manager was a really, really nice person and seemed to really, really like you, but he kept holding meetings at least once a week for your whole department of 17 people? You would begin to hate them. You would begin to wonder why, and then my question might be, what is this doing to the company? Well, if you have a good rapport, why wouldn't you maybe suggest that to well, him to make that, him more First, I want you to appreciate the situation. Oh. And then my next question would have been, assuming that this manager of yours appears to be an S personality, how would you go about attempting to persuade him that he's having excessive meetings and, and maybe should rearrange things? And I think that's a realistic challenge in, in the work environment. How do you persuade him to change his mind? And he's an S personality. What does an S personality want more than anything? Aren't they the social? Yep. S is for social, S is for stable, S is for team player, and they... He wants to be like, so you sell them on, this will make you more favorable with the people working under you. Not just like, they want everybody else to be happy. They want harmony and security from threat more than anything. They don't want to be confronted, challenged. They don't want people angry at them. They want them happy and harmonious. So how, how would that color what you would say to this person? You should probably the people are going to start getting agitated and not look forward to it. Good. Now, how do you say that in a way that won't hurt his feelings? They really like you already. Perfect. You know, people really love working for you, and it's really, really a comfortable, supportive, friendly atmosphere here. And I'm glad I'm part of this team. And but to I, maintain that. Yeah. Good. That's even better. <laughs> and if we want to keep that harmony going, I've got a couple of things I'd like to do chat with you about and see what you think. Nothing confrontational, nothing authoritative, nothing as a deep personality, what we do. Oh, straight up. You know, you have so many damn many meetings, people around here are really starting to get lousy in their performance. <laughs> you can tell them when people start to hate you, he couldn't care less. You're supposed to get the job done. But if you say it's really impacting performance and it's gonna, gonna reach up and bite you in the butt one day if you're not careful, he just wants the facts. But how do you broach that? How do you express that? Okay, anything else? I have a question. Yeah. This assignment three, mm -hmm. it says at the end, discuss whether any of these behaviors might be acceptable in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, do you mean like, this isn't the way that you are all the time, but you could employ this type of behavior in a situation? Or yes. like, this is how you are in general, and people pretty much hate no. you, so there's... No. Okay. I mean, would one of those behaviors in a particular point in time, in a particular situation, perhaps be more acceptable? Okay. Okay? And I would tell you, for example, if we learned that the gas main had exploded next door in the building next door and was apt to explode in our building, and you turned to me and said, get the hell out of here, that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. you know? But explore some of the others and see if you think any of them could be acceptable. Is it, is, is it ever acceptable to be knee-walking drunk with your employees or your co-workers? Mm -hmm. There's an economics term we use to describe that. It's called stupid. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anything else? Thank you. I'll see you next uh, we, we meet next week, I think? I don't remember. We'll look and see. I thought we were.